This is the Life Journey Podcast with Quentin, a.k.a. Q Gauz No Days Off. From on the field and off the field, NFL player and entrepreneur. Motivating you to be the best you can be and getting you out of your comfort zone. Sharing with you travel, sports, and entrepreneurial tips with amazing guests on the show. Now, get ready for your life to change with the Life Journey Podcast and your host, Quentin Gauze. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Life Journey Podcast. You're here with your host, Quentin Gauze. We have two amazing guests on the show today. Wow. Um, And actually, by the way, we're in Ottawa, Canada, um, and we're here with Devon and Pearlie and Clunas. How are you guys doing today? We're doing fantastic. We're doing great, Quinn. Good to be here with you. It's great to be on the show. You know, glad to have you on the show. And um, wow, this is this is an amazing podcast because I've done some international podcasts over laptop, but it's great to be here in a whole nother, <laughs> whole nother um, country and uh, be here as well too. So you first off, Devon, you have a great story and I want to be able to capture that story today on our podcast and Pearlene. Uh, but first off, let's talk about um, both you, how you both met and um, kind of go from there. Oh, well, that's a good story. You want the real version, my version, or his version? Well, let's get both versions. Well, well, here <laughs> is the real version. And, you know, as you said, we have good stories. And what I've come to realize is that most of us, if we take time to really share our stories, we all have some very impactful stories. But in terms of how we met, I was a police officer in the city of Winnipeg. And I always like to say one of the first black police officers in our city. And, you know, at one point in time, we have what's called Grand Beach, a fantastic beach in the city. And I was a fairly young guy. Myself and my best friend said, you know what, we're kind of tired of the whole dating scene. Let's just go to the beach, relax, get away from girls, be by ourselves. (laughs) And there I was with my best friend on the boardwalk. And sure enough, another friend of ours who, you know, is Perlene's very good friend. They see me and my friend on the boardwalk and they come up. Mm-hmm. And they approach us. I absolutely ignored her because, as I said, I was trying to get away from girls. And, you know, uh, two days later, we're at a really cool club in the city. It's called Strawberries. Mm-hmm. And once again, I'm there just minding my own business. <laughs> and that's my story. And I'm sticking with it. What would you have to say, my bride? <laughs> well, you know, there's that side and then the other side. Okay, so now I'll, I'll give you some contextual notes. Okay. So Grand Beach is one of the top 10 um, freshwater beaches in the world. Mm-hmm. Beautiful miles and miles of a fresh beach. There's one area of the beach where the boardwalk is and the girls in the bikinis. They call it the nightclub with bikinis. The, uh, the volleyball pits are there. That's where the hot people oh, go on the boardwalk. <laughs> then the there's the people. east side where the families go. It's very quiet. The babies are playing in the water. And my girlfriend and I went to the east beach okay. where it was quiet. We decided to take a walk down the beach, and as we got closer to the boardwalk, she said, because she was just a new recruit, she was a year into, Mm -hmm. a police officer, I know that guy, he's in a year ahead of us, let's go say hi. So the part about him ignoring me, that part is true, and the part about going to the club and meeting me again, that part is true, but the, the whole thing that he was trying to get away from Anybody who knows Grand Beach, it's very, very, very funny mm-hmm. when he says he went to the boardwalk to but, get away from girls. But here's the thing, Quinn. Okay, in our very young adult minds, and you know, we actually thought that made sense. Okay. Now, as an adult, <laughs> now I've been matured, I realized that was really silly. However, however, it turned out to be the best decision I ever made because... Mm-hmm. That's where I met my bride. Mm. And, and I'm still, she's still my best friend, so <laughs> it obviously turned out okay. Right. Yeah, and so it was good. It's a good story. <laughs> awesome story. I love it. You should write a book about it. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> awesome. So uh, let the people know about, um, you know, about both your career paths and where, where you've gone and um, your childhood of growing up. Well, well, for me, and again, it's a, a long journey. I'll take you all the way back to Jamaica, where I grew up in a place that's called Harmonyville. Mm-hmm. Beautiful place, but, you know, I grew up very poor in terms of we had no electricity, no running water. However, living in Jamaica, in rural Jamaica at the time, you know, I had everything I needed. I didn't believe I was poor. It's only after we immigrated to Winnipeg and you saw everything that, you know, other people had that you thought you were poor. So it really, again, it's quite contextual. And so immigrated to Winnipeg in 1975, left mm-hmm. everything I knew in terms of culture, being raised by my grandparents, you know, brought into a, an entire new culture. And my first year was very challenging. Ended up failing grade six. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting again, it wasn't a very diverse community. Uh, I was literally the only black person in my class. 
And after failing grade six, I remember sitting with my mother and two teachers and hearing these exact words. One of the teachers saying, he's just not a very smart little boy. Let's put him in a class for slow learners. And I remember something just screaming in my head saying, no, I can do this. I always tell people, you know, I think this was my first real God moment because the decision was left to me. Do you want to repeat grade six, which which young person wants to repeat grade six? And I remember thinking, I'm going to feel dumb. I'm going to be older than the rest. But something in my head said, that's the best decision for your future. So as, as a little boy of age 12, I made a decision. This is what you need to do for your future. Mm. Perlene, you can share your early pieces. Well, you know, I hadn't really thought about uh, how I kind of fit into this uh, part of the book, but when Devon and I would be talking about this and later on he would be reflecting on what made the difference in him mm -hmm. um, and then I would reflect on my early childhood. I also, I didn't move from another country but I moved from very small towns to very small towns in northern Manitoba and in the, those towns, you know, people had known each other for hundreds of years, grandparents had known each other so a newbie coming in is difficult to try to assimilate into this a different culture than what you're used to. Mm -hmm. Um, and what happened was, uh, back in the day, um, like in kindergarten, that's when I was in the one town, I was learning to read. I thought I was pretty smart. I was a pretty confident little girl. And then we moved into an even smaller town. And this town was so small that I had the same teacher for grade one and two. Right. And at that time, they would teach you to read by holding up a Dick, Jane, and Spot book. Uh -huh. People from my generation were all like, oh, yeah, yeah, we all learned to read. <laughs> and what the teacher did was she would read the book to the classroom. And I was very good at memorizing every single um, uh, word for each book or mm -hmm. for each page. And she would point to me and just say, Perlene, read it. And I did. So for grade one and two, I was put into um, a group where we basically colored for grade one and two. And she concentrated on kids that couldn't read. Well, grade three came along and I uh, came home from school one day and I was crying. I couldn't do my homework. And so my mother said, well, just read the question. And that's when they realized that I couldn't read. Mm. Now, back in the day, what they would do is the resource teacher would come in and everybody knew it was for the slow kids. They would come in in the classroom and call out the kids who were having trouble, the slow learners, and they would be put into a special class. Mm. So you would get teased at lunchtime. And I was put in those slow learner from grade three to grade six. Right. So that really is your really formidable years. And it was really imprinted on my brain that I was dumb, that I, I couldn't do schoolwork, and that I was just really just not as smart as the rest of the kids. So that's how that impact from mm -hmm. impacted me. So again, you look at where we are now, and I, I think the, the strong message that we want to bring is that we shouldn't stereotype, particularly at those early ages. We need to look at culture, you know, the societal environment that people are being nurtured in, and realize that in every child, there is this incredible potential right. that just requires or needs your nurturing, my nurturing. So I grew up in a part of our city, you know, very low socioeconomic standards. And I remember at a very early age saying to myself that, I'm going to do something to make a difference. By the time I graduated grade nine, the little boy that they said wasn't very smart was graduating top student in the entire school. And I said to myself, I'm going to do something to set an example for other kids who look like me and for the general population that because where you're coming from or what you look like, doesn't matter where you're living, we have this incredible potential. And I never thought I wanted to be a police officer. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, everything I ever saw on television relative to police officers and people who looked like me wasn't very positive. But I went on to university and, and during those days I had a job at a store in our city called The Bay and I was in security. And while I was doing that job, I had the opportunity for the first time to talk to a police officer face to face. This was a Caucasian police officer and I told him how much I enjoyed that job. At the time, I'd never seen a black police officer in our city. And that officer encouraged me to become a police officer. And the reason I said yes was not because I love police work, mm -hmm. but I thought this would set the example. So that's why I went into police work. Didn't even know how much you got paid. I just thought that will set the example. And so I became a police officer and uh, over the years, rose through the ranks, finally in 2012 to become the chief of police, the first black chief wow. of police in the history of Canada. Canada. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's powerful. That's amazing. That's a powerful story. And, and just hearing both of you talk about like, um, getting put in like the smaller classes or stu students getting picked up. It's funny, I was actually in the same predicament. Like they said I had an IEP, which is an individual education plan in the United States. And they labeled me in kindergarten saying, wow. um, well, he can't 
he's he can't learn Spanish and English because my mother's from Central America. Mm-hmm. He can't learn Spanish and English. Uh, he needs to just he needs to just learn. Well, he can't learn just Spanish. Uh, he needs to learn just English. So let's focus on that. I guess I couldn't learn it as fast. Mm-hmm. So that yeah, that they put me in the smaller classrooms and same same situation and that same thing. It just made it made me hungry to like um, prove them wrong and. Um, ended up graduating with a 3.5 GPA in high school and stuff like that too. So it's great hearing that story of other people that you know are older than me that have been through the same thing that are still um, hard workers that are grinding. So it's great to see that. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a lot of younger kids, you know, that um, they, they really live that stereotype. They like, oh well, I guess I uh, got this. Uh, in, what do they call it? Individual education plan. I I guess I'm not smart. I'm just gonna live my life this way. And that's not the way you're supposed to, you know, mm-hmm. think beyond that. So it's great hearing that. Go ahead and get well, well, one of the things too is that I think the essential part of the first book that we wrote is it's a tribute to teachers. Mm. So what happened was when he had this opportunity to to stay back in grade six, uh, um, this lovely teacher called Miss Hannah came to Devon and said, "If you come an hour early every day after school or before school, I will help you," mm. and he did. So that was the catalyst. And so later on, as he went through his life. I think he's probably at the rank of inspector and he was really reflecting back and how did his life go like this, you know, right. coming from Jamaica, no running water, you know, no indoor plumbing. And, and now he's an inspector and he felt so blessed to be in that position. And then he, we were talking and he said, it's Miss Hannah. I have to find Miss Hannah. So he went down to the school board and asked if he could find Miss Hannah with his uniform on, didn't mm-hmm. want to look like a stalker and asked if he could find her to thank her. And they told her sadly that she had passed away. But every time he had a chance and opportunity to speak, he would always um, give credit to Miss Hannah and talk about how she influenced his life. Mm-hmm. Then when he was in the running to become chief of police, you can share that little next little part. Yeah, so this was really important. So again, they had told me that she had passed away. So I always like to share that, hey, the power, the influence that one person can bring and then the ripple effect. So now in 2012, I'm in the running to become the chief of police and my name and my face is consistent in the paper. And one day I get a call at home. And it's from one of my officers calling me and he says, Devon, I don't know if this makes sense, but my neighbor works at the school board office. They remember you coming in looking for this teacher. She hasn't passed away, but she's in the hospital with a terminal illness. Mm. Like literally, I ran to Perlene and I said, I can't believe this. Miss Hannah is still alive. I get a chance to thank her. So Quinn, I put on my best suit and I go down to the hospital. I find her room. I knock, I walk in. I hadn't seen Miss Hannah in 36 years. I walk in and I said, Miss Hannah, do you remember a little boy named Devon Tunis? She looks at me and she says, yes, and I'm praying that you become the next chief of police. I said, Miss Hannah, thank you that I can even apply for the position. Because if not for what you did all those years ago, I wouldn't be where I am. And I said, you probably did it for hundreds of other kids, but never heard thank you. So I want to thank you for every single one of those kids. And we just sat and we talked. And yes, Miss Hannah passed away three weeks later. But as I told you earlier, I became the 17th chief of police in our city's history and the first who looks like me in the history of our country. Not because I'm so brilliant, but because one person decided I'm going to invest in a life. Mm-hmm. And so I challenge each person to say, invest in one life. You never know what the effects, the ripple effects mm-hmm. of that is going to be. And never label any child as not having the capacity. We within community have to build that up within every child. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as we shared our stories and he had um, at a very young age, somebody step in and, and was willing to help. You know, I would reflect on like, who was there for little Perlene? I, I, nobody came in. I grew up feeling like I was really, you know, not very smart. I had a stigma around spelling still to this day. If I have to spell something in front of somebody, I go, I go blank. So it's affecting me now. How many years later? And so when our family moved, when I was in grade seven to the city, the Winnipeg was the capital of Manitoba. Mm-hmm. And I went to a school, 2,000 kids. Nobody knew who I was. And it was the first year the school was open, brand new school. Right. So kids were coming from all over the place. So they were all new. There wasn't any clicks for them right. or anything like that. And I tried really hard because I was always a hard worker. And at the end of grade seven, I made honor roll. And I'm like, whew, I fooled all those teachers. They do not know I'm really not smart. Grade eight came along. I had this wonderful teacher and uh, she treated me like I was just like everybody else. Mm-hmm. I made the honor roll again. And I went through all high school thinking, wow, I just fooled them all. And, but I always had in the back of my mind, somebody's going to figure out that I'm not so smart one day. So after Devon had had the chance to find Miss Hannah and thank her, um, I still always kind of felt a little sorry for myself. 
um, that I never had that teacher. And one day Devon and I were um, going for a walk in a park behind our house and um, we were again talking about how grateful he was that he was able to thank Miss Hannah. And then all of a sudden I thought, okay, you know what? I must have somebody. Who would it be in my life that made me feel, maybe they didn't do anything. And I'm like, uh-huh, my grade eight teacher, Mrs. Danuk. I said, she didn't do anything special, no special treatment, but she just assumed or made me feel like she assumed I was smart, mm -hmm. that I could do the work, that I could get the A's. And I said, I would love to know what happened to her. And I took 20 more steps and I looked up in the path and right in front of me was Mrs. Deneuve. And I haven't seen her in like 30 some years since graduating. Wow. And I'm like, you won't believe this, Mrs. Deneuve. But I was just saying to my husband, he's a police officer, he, I'm not lying. I'd love to find you and thank you. And I gave her a big hug and I said, thank you so much for what you did. You didn't do anything special, but you made me feel like I was smart. So thank you for all of the other kids that you did this for. And that was it. Well, two years later, fast forward, we were at the book launch for the little boy from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. It was huge. It was packed out. And we finally made her, well, one of the interesting things is the, the radio personality, he was doing the emceeing for the event. Mm -hmm. And nobody had ever asked me this and nobody knew the story. My close friends, my parents, Devon knew that I felt had this insecurity. And he looked at me and he said, Perlene, how does this story personally affect you? And I got this big lump in my throat. I'm like, I'm going to say this in front of all these people. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, it's important. So I shared the story and said, thank you to Ms. Deneuve. Made my, our way back to the signing table at the end and getting ready to sit down. I look up and there's Mrs. Deneuve. I'm like, Mrs. Deneuve, how did you ever? She goes, oh, I've been following this. I brought her around the table and I began to give her a hug and thank her again for being a change maker. And she goes, no, 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 no. You are the change maker. I said, how am I the change maker? She goes, no, you changed my life. I said, how? She goes, that day you met me on the path, my mother had just passed away and your kind words carried me for the months to come. Thanks mm -hmm. for changing my life. So when we share the story, we share about being grateful and just being able to say thank you to the people who make a difference in your life because you don't know if you may not get an opportunity in the future. So that's kind of how we both relate to the book. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's powerful. Powerful stories. Powerful stories. Um, just having gratitude and um, being thankful for people that, that make that impact. And um, yeah, I think every child, every person um, has that kind of figure in their life, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, even, you know, in the in United States and Rochester, you know, there's some kids that grow up that may not have a father and stuff like that. And it's just the mother in the household and their environment make is their family, you know, yes. so gangs and drugs and all that. But it really, it, at the end of the day, it, it is the community of people, solid people that help raise you mm -hmm. I mean, along with your parents and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's great hearing you know, that you both have been through something, you know, been through that and. Um, how those people have impacted you and been an influence in your life. So that's amazing. And um, just to act, kind of come back to it, you know, how did it feel becoming the first uh, black uh, police chief uh, in Canada, like in history? Like you, that's that's a major thing. Like that's. <laughs> it is a major <laughs> thing, a major I know. Thing. And I will tell you, as I said, I wanted to become a police officer to set an example. And I felt great when I was just, let's say, a constable. And then I got my first promotion. And I thought, ah, you know, what's my responsibility as a supervisor? Well, my responsibility first and foremost is for the care of our people. And then as I rose up the ranks and became the chief of police, it really hit me when a colleague of mine, who actually is now the chief of police here in Ottawa, mm -hmm. Peter Slowly, he called me from Toronto and said, do you realize you're the first black chief of police in Canadian history? And it's all of a sudden it was like the weight you just realized, oh my goodness. And it's sad, but here is the reality. I knew that anything I did from here on in, people weren't, wouldn't just be looking at, it was a police chief. It's the black chief of police. So I really felt this sense of responsibility and ownership that I had to excel because they weren't just looking at me. They were looking at people of color. I know you're going to do it well. And so I worked incredibly hard because I realized this was not just about Devon. Devon. So yes, you know, I was very happy to be a chief of police, but I also was very aware of my responsibility, not just to myself. Yeah. And sometimes maybe, yes, that drove me too hard because I, they were talking about 15 hour days. I wanted to ensure that everything you did was above, just maintain the highest integrity because it was not just about me. And yeah. gentlemen, was there any struggles um, along that way, along that pathway while you were a chief of police? Oh, there were some significant struggles, but, but again, I always say, you know, it's about you knowing who you are 
while you're in that particular role that you're not there for the glory of the position. And so for me, it was about how I led. So for me, integrity was always utmost. And I'll share this piece with you because certainly I'm a person of faith. I'm not here to preach to anyone, but I'm saying I was also a police chaplain before I became uh, the chief of police. And so early on, I was asked, okay, what can we do for our city? Our city was at that point murder capital, crime capital, and a faith-based organization asked me, what should we do? Well, I have to be honest and I have to be integrous. And I knew there would be some challenges, but I said, hey, as people of faith, you should pay for pray for the welfare of our city. Well, that was not received very well initially, like right across the country. And I had to stand and face public media saying, a person in your position should not be speaking about this. And finally I said, this is who I am. And I'm not saying you have to be who I am, but I'm saying all of us have a part to play and bring the very best of who you are to the table. And I stood firm on that. And it was a major challenge, I have to tell you. But it set the tone for who I was and how I would lead. And it wasn't about you know, any particular group, but it was about the collective. And I can tell you our city saw the greatest level of cohesion, the greatest reduction in crime during that time because we have to stand firm. And unfortunately, oftentimes I don't see people being courageous in terms of living who they are consistently. True. You gotta be transparent. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's a big step. A lot of people, what, Somebody else probably wouldn't have done that. You know, um, when you got the entire country looking at you, mm -hmm. that's a lot of pressure. And but, yeah, but you'd think that something, saying something like that would be a divisive. But it actually ended up turning out to be the opposite because after that, Devon got letters from leaders from the Muslim community, wow. from other communities saying, we are so glad you said that. We're with you. We're behind you. Uh, we're together. We believe the same way. So he got the support of the community. And because of that community support, and then churches started saying, well, what can we do? And he, and he, he mm. said, in that comedy, he said, prayer, but then action behind it. Mm -hmm. So the churches started getting involved and physically doing things, and it was an amazing thing. So the headlines went from saying, uh, Winnipeg doesn't have a prayer in the world, and they showed a picture of Devon sitting at his desk looking like he was praying. And a year later, it's like, it, prayers have been answered, crime drops, this drops, that drops. So it turned out really well mm -hmm. in the end. Wow. Well. And again, all of this was with no additional expenditures, right? Mm -hmm. It was simply about the community starting to act as one. Right. Yes. And, uh, and kind of going back, you said you worked, you know, 15 hours. Just, uh, this, this, your focus was just on, you know, locked in on your, on your job. How did that affect the family? Oh, what a great question. What a profound <laughs> question. Thank you, young man, for asking meaningful questions. Because part of what we do now, you know, we look back and say, okay, What's leadership? Is leadership just about what you do at work or is leadership about what also transpires at home? Take it away. Well, we've, we've, had a couple, we've had almost three years out now to be able to look at this in hindsight. And I've always been interested in neurology and how the brain works. And we're both, ta he's taking a course, we're reading books about that. And we could have done things better. Mm -hmm. Nobody prepares you for this job. Nobody says this is the requirements it's going to be. This is how you could fit into this life or, you know, I know you're going to have a lot on your mind when you get home, but your wife also has to feel part of it or you're not feeling part of a life that is happening away from you. There's a lot of things that we could have done better. And so now when we do leadership training, we are often um, uh, uh, beginning to be asked to speak uh, to leadership from both sides of, uh, of the coin. Uh, because I mean, I've had I've ex have experience with leadership because I had a business for 27 years, mm -hmm. so I have that kind of experience, and I thought I had a pretty good grasp of what it would be like to be in this position because my girlfriend who introduced us, she was a police officer, so I went through it with her. So I thought I had the inside mm -hmm. of it, um, but I realized that that there were still so many things we could have done better, so that we could have come out on the other side better faster. Right. So, so, so let me give you a practical example because my entire career, right? And, you know, people said, yes, you did all these things so well. And by and large, I would say, yes, I feel good. I feel blessed that the things I did was successful. But part of what we've always been taught was that leave work at work. I think that's a fallacy. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do now, like everything, the course that I'm taking, I'm like, Perlene, you would love this. And I get her involved in anything and everything. But in the past, we were told in terms of leadership, especially at that level, the things we were dealing with, leave it at home, but you come home, it's not at home, it's in your head and your head's there. And I thought, what if I had been sharing all this stuff with my wife rather than listening to what 
I was taught is, mm -hmm. you know, taught historically in terms of leadership. Yeah. And so I think it's always important now to look back and say, okay, you did this well, what didn't you do so well? And so my desire is to share that with the next crop because I think there's a better way for us to do this thing we call leadership. No, at this level, we shouldn't be leaving it at work. I should be coming home and sharing my wife, oh, here's this incredible struggle that I have to go through today and she can be part of it with me and you can be stronger. And so I'm just thankful again, I'm not preaching to anyone. I'm like, God's got us at this place and I'm very thankful because without that, I don't think we would have come through in a fairly healthy way that you can now go forward. So yeah, there's a lot more. We should always be evolving. Mm -hmm. right. I don't like to see us in the same place year after year after year. But in terms of leadership, I think we're failing leadership because some of these old paradigms have been allowed to exist for so long. Right. We want to help to change that. You know, when you know better, you do better, right? And we have uh, one of our hashtags that we have for our business, it's better to be better. Mm -hmm. um, and we realize now through science, and this is maybe not taught enough, that, and I would love to be teaching this to the future leaders, is we used to think that there was different boxes in your brain. You have your work box, and you have your kids box, and then you have your family box, and you have your wife box, and none of them, they don't touch. But now we realize that's not the way the brain works. Mm -hmm. It's integrated. And um, I think that um, the newer generation are much more willing to understand that we have to be holistic, that we have to work with all, you know, your, the way that you eat affects the way that your brain thinks, the way that your brain, you know, you, we're all, it's, it's connected. So we have to have a healthy um, family life, a healthy inner life in order to be the best you can be as a leader. Right. And so before that, that didn't care. You know, you could have as many divorces on the side as you want, didn't affect how you led, but yet it does. It affects your compassion and it affects your ability to connect with people when you're having chaos in your in the background. So now we've, we're hoping to integrate all of the aspects of a human being to be the best that they can be through leadership. Wow, you know what? Um, in the in the book that um, you know Tara had, you have the it says uh, it's Aristotle's quote and it's a uh, excellent. What, what is, uh, what's the exact? Oh, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like pretty much like um, excellence. You know, pretty much having good habits um, allow you to be successful in your life. And I remember my coach had that on our walls at fo in our in our football facilities. And yeah, you got to live the right way. Um, yeah. And that ma it makes perfect sense from what mm -hmm. you're saying. Like mm -hmm. it does. Like mm -hmm. eating Big Macs and you're, like you said, having all these uh, different relationships and stuff. And you're at a high position. That doesn't look good. You know, at the end of the day, you got all this, you know, gunk and dirt. And, you know, it's, it's you're trying to look good on the outside, but the inside is just filthy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Know? So, no, it's amazing that you said that. Uh, and... One, I guess, I guess, kind of coming to this point, like with relationships and stuff, and marriages and stuff like that. Um, you know, you kind of already kind of touched on it a bit already. But how can some people that are listening right now, because we have some people on Facebook watching, people around the world that's going to listen to this podcast, how can they better their marriages? How can they, you know, you, you, from the point you know you say I do to twenty five, you know, whatever years later, how do you keep that consistent? Ah. Uh. You know, I, I love the questions you pose as a young man. So here's what I say. I grew up in a single parent home. But intrinsically, I would look around and say, there's something missing. And again, as a teenager, I said to myself, one day I want to be a husband and a father. Now, initially for me, I thought being a good husband and a father was, I am there. I would never leave. Absolutely. But at age 29, I remember, you know, I was in a men's group at church. And again, I want to be the best husband I can. So I figured, what's the best way to learn? Well, go to people who are older, who actually have done this. And so I was in a group with all these older men, much older than me. I was the only so-called young person there. But I would sit around and I would listen to these guys. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard was this. And, you know, one of the gentlemen said, I just leave my wife little notes where I know that she'll find them. I'm like, hey, I can do that. So I went home and I executed that. I started leaving little notes where I know she would find them. Ask her how large the box is of notes that she currently has. And then I would start just writing her poetry, these sorts of things. So, so how can you do that? If it's your heart's desire, as I said, and it's the same thing in leadership, don't just repeat what we've seen everybody else. Learn and try and do something. Thank you for listening to the Life Journey Podcast.